Good morning, everyone. Today, our session is dedicated to businesses. As it has been the case since the beginning of this regional meeting, our session will take place online thanks to the logistical organization of our friend at Regeneration Canada and to the contribution of the French Embassy in Washington, which I would like to, to thank warmly for their involvement and support. As a reminder, the objective of the regional meeting is to give the floor to all stakeholders who can act on soil health and soil carbon sequestration, decision makers, farmers, scientists, NGOs and businesses. Each has, has been and will be able to present its point of view and will be able to interact with the other. At the end of the week of meeting, we hope to be able to propose a synthesis in the form of a regional roadmap for concrete action on the ground in favor of soil carbon storage and soil health through agriculture and forestry. Our session today should last 90 minutes in order to allow enough time for exchanges and we will always have the comfort of simultaneous translation, as Antonio said, in French and in English, even if though most of the presentation will be in English. I should point out that each session is recorded in order to be able, available for also for those who cannot be with us today. As there are many of us online, we will be using a webinar configuration. All microphones and camera are switched off by default with a chat room for technical question and a section at your disposal for question and answers to the speakers. When you ask a question, please, in this section, start by specifying to whom the question is addressed so that it will be easy for us to ask on your behalf at the end of the session that question. Even if you are not the originator of the question, you can like it so that we can identify it easily the most popular question to ask first. As I've been doing since Tuesday, at the end of the session, we'll be making available online a survey in the form of a multiple choice question to get your feedback on a few targeted questions. Please respond within the time limit by limiting the number of questions to three when you can give more answer than one. For those of you who have been following us from the beginning, who have already noticed that some questions are common to each session and some other are session specific. For our business session today, we will have three presentations of 15 minutes each, or even maybe more, although you have them, they are summarized bibliography, biography in the agenda. I would appreciate if each speaker could briefly introduce themselves at the beginning of their presentation. The presentation will be mainly in English, as I said, but if you want to choose French, you can select it at the bottom of your screen if using a computer, as Antonius remember you. And the material for this presentation will be available after the regional meeting and will be sent to you today or tomorrow. Without further ado, I will give the floor to Mrs. Kimberly Cornish, director of the Food Water Wellness Foundation we will talk about soil carbon measurement and predictive mapping using remote sensing and machine learning, sorry, pilot project in Alberta. Mrs. Kimberly Cornish, dear Kimberly, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Paul. I really appreciate this opportunity to speak. Um, I remember when the French government put forward the 4 for 1000 initiative, in 2015 and it was a validation of work that we had been looking at for for many years and we're really excited that there's an international movement to further the work of farmers and scientists on the ground so um, i'll share my screen i think Is the okay? Um, uh, as mentioned, I am a director of Food Water Wellness Foundation. Uh, it's my background is not in soil science, which is 
been an interesting space over these last few years, trying to work with a lot of soil scientists and farmers. Um, I'm actually, uh, my background was in international development. And I, when I got interested in food security and carbon sequestration was working with the Kalahari Bushmen in Namibia, Africa and seeing how a society that was 20,000 years old um, could no longer uh, maintain their, their food security practices that they'd had for, for millennia and, and were really in a food insecure space. And so I think it's a very interesting time and space with COVID and, and a, a renewed interest in food security to be also looking at soil carbon sequestration and as a climate solution and how they can, how the confluence of the two work together. Um, uh, Food Water Wellness Foundation was uh, started in 2013 um, after eight years of, of working in, in the, those two spaces. And I remember when we were putting our, our, our mission and vision statement together, I had to explain to the board what carbon sequestration was. And so this is, it's very exciting to see how things have progressed in the last seven years. Um, I'm also, um, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting space to be in this business section because um, I would probably have put myself in the NGO category or, or the scientist category, but I hope that I can do some justice to how um, possibly the science and the work of, of a not-for-profit can be, could use a market mechanism to incentivize a shift into regenerative agricultural practices and also and move forward um, carbon sequestration as a, as a real viable climate solution on a large scale. So um, once Food Water Wellness Foundation was founded, the first thing we did was go out and talk to farmers. And we wanted to find out what they were doing, what was working. And, um, and from there, if they were doing something that was unique, um, why it wasn't being uh, adopted on a mass scale. So one of the farms we worked with was in the initial um, initial sets of interviews we did was shipwheel feeders. They're down in Tabor, Alberta, which is the southeastern part of Alberta. It's a high intensive uh, agricultural area, very sandy soil. Um, and uh, when they started, they started with holistic management in, in 1980. And they used to have sand dunes that would just blow across the highway and across their land. And uh, they put into place a perennial pasture and they have managed it in an adaptive multi-paddock way or a holistically managed way for the, for the last 40 years. And they've seen a, an increase in their productivity by 38, 3,800% um, from, from the initial start or the, the, the initial times where they've, where they've, they've just seen a massive increase in forage. And they've also seen their soil organic matter go from under 1% to 4.7 at the last readings they did. And so um, we, we talked to them and, and a lot of other farmers around Alberta to see why other producers weren't doing this. And they, they said they really can't understand in a lot of ways because it seems so they've had so much, it's been such a win-win on, on every level. There's been a higher water holding capacity. Um, their neighbors turned on their pivots um, 68 times and they turned theirs on four in a drought year because of the water holding capacity. So we, we they said, first of all, the principles that they've been using that have allowed their that to see this incredible shift in their soil carbon is, is this six tiered stage where they're trying to maximize photosynthesis, diversity, they're reducing their nutrient inputs, um, they're managing livestock in a really effective way, they're making sure there's a cover on the soil and they're trying to reduce and do no tillage. And, but this looks very different on a bunch of different categories and, and everybody's implementing this in a different way. 
um, but they were frustrated that they were seeing these huge increases in their soil carbon and they couldn't get any recognition for it in the market. Alberta has a, an established offset system. It has been um, mostly based on a practice-based um, conservation cropping protocol. Um, there's two regions and farmers get paid the same amount no matter how much soil carbon they actually have in their soil. They get paid for doing a no-till practice and, and that, that has just been the way that it's been done. But when we're seeing these huge um, potential numbers, so at 5% soil organic matter, we're looking at uh, 237 tons of CO2 equivalent that is being stored in, in the soil and, and that per hectare. And that is really significant. Um, we've looked at um, another ranch, uh, Doug Ray, Ray Ranch, and they've, you know, over 20 years of doing very similar practices, they've seen an increase in their soil organic matter of 5%. And so by those numbers, if you cut it in half and you had a 2.5% increase in the soil organic matter, Canada would be able to meet its entire target for 2030 in nature-based solutions of 30 megatons with only 622,000 acres um, sequestering carbon at that level. And so uh, the, there was this large impetus from the farmers to say, we really need a way to measure carbon on our land specifically. We don't, we don't want to be part of an average system over a large, large section of, of we don't want to be part of a conservative estimate of what everybody is doing. We want to be recognized because we're doing something exceptional. And that led me to uh, the UNFAO conference at GSOC at, in 2017 in Rome, where I met Gabrielle, and it was because of Seth Itzken that I managed to uh, know about the conference. So say, thank you, Seth, if you're listening today. Um, and there I met Dr. Alex McBratney from the University of Sydney, and um, he talked about his work to work on, on farm scale soil carbon auditing. From that point forward, um, we got in touch with uh, his former grad student who uh, did a lot of the, her PhD thesis formed a lot of, of, of that work that also has created the, the, the basis for the Emissions Reduction Fund in Australia, where there is farm scale carbon auditing, there's a baseline taken and then uh, it's remeasured within three to seven years and the, the farmer can get carbon credits for that delta of, of the carbon that they put in the soil. And um, so through developing a relationship with the Shawnee and her, and her husband, Tom Hangle, uh, we developed an approach for uh, a pilot project in Alberta to, to use machine learning covariate to, to to covariates to determine the relationship between soil properties and remotely sensed data. And we're able to do this at a density of four cores per square kilometer, which I just realized this morning, it was like a moment of insight that that's four per 1000 square meters also, which was just a happy accident, but I was very, I was enlivened to, to see that. And uh, if, Everybody, I hopefully everybody caught Brandon Hung's presentation uh, a couple days ago because he really dove into uh, predictive mapping and soil carbon measurement and um, and what the capabilities are of of mapping. And um, so, as we went forward, we we wanted to make sure that we were going to capture the high performers of, of soil carbon sequestration. So we, we found sites that, had, that were exceptionally well managed, that we were seeing a massive difference between them and their neighbors doing similar types of practices um, or similar, or they were fell into like a, a, the classification that we would say it, it would be a perennial crop, it would be pasture, but it was being done in a way that they were having very different results. And then we also um, wanted to have cooperative neighbors that were doing 
different management practices. And so we could be able to show how that carbon sequestration, what, what the difference was and also what the potential is. I sometimes joke that we are kind of taking a Maslow's approach to, um, to, to agriculture. We're looking as he looked at, at people that were self-actualized and, and doing amazing and like living a very happy, healthy, well-adjusted life and performing exceptionally. Um, instead of looking at dysfunction, we're doing the same. We're trying to really focus on, on producers that are having quite remarkable results. And then there was a, a whole other factor, set of factors that we wanted to look at. And so when we were doing sites, so we have eight sites of clusters of farms around the province, um, starting at um, up in the Peace Country, which I was just up there after a 2020, I think it was actually closer to to 25 or maybe 30 hours of driving um, amid some soil sampling. And then we go um, to the middle area to Tomahawk, and then we've got some in central Alberta and all the way down to Tabor. And so we tried to pick as many um, bio subregions as we could to represent the landscape conditions in Alberta and also a temperature gradient and a precipitation gradient. Um, uh, Tom Hengel in the Netherlands has been uh, from Open Geo Hub and Envirometrics, uh, has developed our sampling plan and he used 60, over 60 layers of covariate data to create the sampling plan. Uh, this is a schema of predictive soil mapping, which I am, I understand on a level of, of of generally being able to understand it, but I will never become a, a coder and, and be able to fully function in this space. But it basically takes all the 60 layers of covariate data, it looks for unique combinations in that, and then it's able to represent the landscape conditions in the most effective way possible. So uh, we get these random uh, points, uh, picked by the, that is created through this Latin hypercube uh, machine learning algorithm. And uh, as a result, we end up going on a bit of a wild goose chase. I, I sometimes call it like uh, the, the rural version of, of uh, Pokemon Go because we're wandering around with our GPSs trying to find this random point in the middle of it. And sometimes they're in the middle of, of very inopportune spaces, but by doing this type of sampling, we will be able to extrapolate the data for the entire province of Alberta um, and have at least a baseline carbon map as well as, um, as, well as the other uh, soil properties we're looking at. So um, this, is, this is the sampling plan. This is on Ray Ranch that I mentioned. Um, and then we were using a, a, a hydraulic mounted on a skid steer on rubber tracks because it is very low compaction that we have and we're able to get into spaces that um, I've as I've learned in in wet conditions but uh, we couldn't go with even a truck mounted uh, hydraulics and we're taking uh, meter deep cores that are three inches squared and, um, and then we're breaking them down and, and doing lab analysis to really develop like a holistic picture of what's happening in the soil. And, um, and we're trying to, to create a, a data set that will enable us to really understand what's happening with carbon dynamics and, and, and how that's moving forward. Um, notably, um, we're also, we're able to do hyperspectral scans through a partnership with Benoit Rivard at the University of Alberta. So the cores before they get broken down are getting scanned and, um, and then we're working with Preston Sorensen uh, to, to develop some models so that we'll be able to extrapolate that and, and hopefully at some point be able to do field conditions, um, hyperspectral or, or some spectral scans. And then we're also looking at um, uh, uh, the metagenomics and the and nutrient cycling and availability that's happening and then how that's impacting carbon as well as soil health. And, and also we really are interested in how water is, 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 is behaving in, in higher carbon soils 
and, and how that can help us model um, flood mitigation and, and risk as well. So uh, flood and drought mitigation. So um, when it's all said and done with, this is, this is a map from uh, Australia from work that was done there. But we'll, we're able to model exactly or, or map exactly where carbon is distributed on the landscape. And I think what is going to be very interesting is, and we're still in the early, we're still in our first round of soil sampling, um, but uh, I'm, I'm very excited to see the maps when they come out because I think that it's going to show carbon distribution in a really, really interesting way. And there was a question um, in, the, in the Wednesday session about why are we spending money on mapping things and giving money to scientists instead of giving money to farmers. Uh, to, to actually do this work. And uh, my, my argument for that would be to see when we can actually see how the practices are changing soil on the landscape. There's, there's an incentive to, for other farmers to, to understand the benefits, but also there's, there's a, a, a true incentive to shift into uh, uh, well, there's a validation that we could look at market mechanisms and we could use the existing Alberta or, or potentially national offset system or the voluntary market to quantify this carbon and, and actually pay farmers for, for, the, for the accumulation of it on their land as, as, another, as another crop. And so um, I think that um, I... It's, it's been an interesting road and um, we've learned a lot just in out in soil sampling. And, and there was comments earlier in the week that we can't do it on a farm scale because it's, or it's really hard to do it on a farm scale because it, it's hard. And, and I would agree, it is hard. This is what I woke up to sampling yesterday morning after it had been 23 degrees the day before. And it was minus two and we were out in, in the snow again sampling. But um, I think it, it's really important. And I think that we need to look at it um, because when we make, cat, when we look at categories, so uh, earlier in the week too, we talked about the difference between perennial crops versus annual crops. And so this is a perennial crop. This is a native range, a dryland and native rangeland in Southern Alberta. And this is the quality and condition. This is also a dry land. Um, it, it's, it's, it's more tame has come in, but they haven't planted it to be tame. It's just, it's, it's evolved. Um, and this is 10 miles away. And this is the soil sample that, that came out of that piece of land. And so it really, how we're managing this land as opposed to it being annual or perennial makes a significant difference. And then uh, just across the fence, we have an annual crop uh, that was corn last year. Uh, I think it's going to be um, into canola this year. Um, but this was the soil sample that we took across the fence from this soil sample. And, and it's just been, it's been, we've, we've hypothesized that this is what was going on because of the, the other soil samples, but it's been absolutely shocking to see how, how this is actually um, so illustrative, it's illustrated by the, the carbon sampling. And um, this, is, uh, this is Blake Holtman, this is uh, the, the owner of Shipwheel Farms. And this is, he's standing um, just behind his land on his neighbor's place. And um, he is uh, showing uh, the, the sand dune that was, that was present on his land um, when, he, when he started uh, managing his land differently. Um, but this continues, th this, uh, this cropland uh, continues to blow. And so they've actually uh, cut it, cut in. And if you can see, there's actually um, three, three levels of, of, of fencing here, right in this, uh, there's a low, medium and high fence. And, and that's because the, the, the sand, the soil keeps blowing to a, to a level that they have to keep increasing the fence levels to keep what used to be uh, an area for grazing, to keep the cattle out of the crop. 
And, and I think that um, when, I, when I, we look at what's possible in terms of carbon sequestration at those high numbers and, and how this could really be mobilized as a climate solution that could also enable producers to increase their revenue streams. Um, it's, it, it is worth the it, level of, of really being able to narrow in and look at the, the carbon sequestration that's happening on individual land and at the rate that we're sampling. It's for most operations, it's not a ridiculous number of samples. And I think it can be cost effective, especially if there is a, an offset protocol that can recognize this type of, of actual farm auditing and um, carbon sequestration at the individual farm scale. So uh, I think that's pretty much, yep, that's, that's me, so. Thank you very much, Kimberly. Very, well, very good illustration, in fact. <laughs> then it's difficult to find argument against when you look at the picture. So I will, um, we, we'll, there are some questions coming and uh, we will answer to them in, in the last part of, uh, of our session. Thank you very much. And so keep, uh, yes, keep your connection on. You, we will ask questions to you. I think we, we have a little bit of trouble with uh, the connection with Dan. So maybe we'll um, move forward and uh, ask Debbie to take the floor first, if she don't mind. So um, I just would like to for, to, for our audience to don't forget to ask a question in the Q&A section and vote for the most relevant one, uh, if you find one who suits you and we will deal with them in the order of preference at the end of our session. So now I will give the floor to Mrs. Debbie Reid, uh, Executive Director of the Ecosystem Service Market Consortium. Debbie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, perfectly. Okay, perfect, thank you. So thank you so much and thank you, Kimberly, for that excellent presentation. It's actually a nice tee up for what I wanted to talk about. Um, I actually see that I'm not starting at the beginning. So my name is Debbie Reed. I am the executive director of the Ecosystem Service Market Consortium, which is a new so, national. Sorry, sorry, Debbie. Could, could you close? Could you come close to your mic because uh, there are a lot of echo in in the room. Oh yes. Okay. Is that better? That, that's better. That's better. Yes. All right. Thank you. I'll also try to speak slowly, but I get excited and speak fast. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to uh, talk about a new national level um, program that we have launched in the United States to scale ecosystem service impacts from agriculture um, and talk about what we're doing and um, how we started. So I really appreciate the work of the four per 1000 organization. And I, like Kimberly, was really excited when this um, came up in 2015, led by the French government um, historically, soil carbon had actually been on the agenda as part of the framework convention discussions, but um, back in the 90s, when I, was, when I started working on this, there was disagreement about the actual technical ability of soils to sequester carbon and issues um, such as permanence were a, a large part of the disagreements which led to it being taken off the table within the international negotiations. So, I really appreciate that, um, both technically and politically, they're back on the table, given that they're so incredibly important. So I'll talk about um, ESMC and um, our activities in this space, starting with our mission. So we are a nonprofit organization set up really to scale incentives for farmers and ranchers to improve soil health systems that benefit society. I like to point out that we as a society are demanding more and more from the agricultural sector, including improved uh, uh, ecological outcomes like improved natural resource conservation, improved water quality, improved soil carbon sequestration. If in fact, 
uh, we expect farmers and ranchers to continue to produce food, fuel, fiber, um, et cetera, as well as these benefits, we really have to provide the tools for farmers and ranchers to do that. So that is the mission of our organization, to ensure that those tools are there to incentivize farmers and ranchers. And Kimberly spoke incredibly well to the fact that we need to provide not just educational um, materials and opportunities, but also finance-based um, and incentive-based opportunities to help them understand what it is, um, which impacts we're looking for and how best they can achieve them in a way that works on their own farms and ranches. We started by literally assessing everything that had happened in the agricultural space related to market-based and uh, uh, market-based approaches and incentives. And we designed our market literally to overcome all of the challenges that we've seen there. So our market was both conceived and designed for agriculture. So it is literally 100% focused on agriculture, farmers and ranchers. We also designed it to overcome past market challenges. And we started not only with an assessment of existing and, and past markets, but also we started with a demand side assessment. We commissioned an analysis of, could we create a market that has enough demand to provide financial incentives to farmers and ranchers? And that informed how we designed our market. And then finally, we recognized that farmers and ranchers, um, again, to achieve the impacts we're seeking, not only need to be rewarded, um, but recognized for their efforts. And there's, um, there has been a history, I think, of viewing agriculture as a problem, right? Particularly when it comes to environmental outcomes and not enough uh, recognition of the actual beneficial impact. So that's what our market is really designed to do. Um, how are we different from other markets? So we are established as a public-private partnership in which all of our members are collectively investing in the very programmatic and structural underpinnings of a technolo technologically advanced market um, that will meet buyer demand. And we view buyers um, as, as different, and I'll speak to that as I continue my presentation. But the sellers in our market are in fact farmers and ranchers. So, the very basis of our market is um, incorporating farmers and ranchers in developing the market, in pilot testing the market, um, and then um, ensuring that they continue to be an, uh, an important voice and component of our market. I spoke already about how our market is designed and conceived exclusively for agriculture. Um, when we started to develop the programmatic investments and in infrastructure of our market, we designed protocols that are very innovative compared to what we ha have seen um, in the past and in the existing market. So our protocols um, jointly develop uh, credits for soil carbon, net greenhouse gases, water quality, and water quantity. And the important component here is that they are outcomes based, they are not practice based, and they are farm and field, uh, based on farm and field quantification approaches so that we can in fact, if we provide enough of a sing signal to farmers and ranchers, we know that they will respond. And so it also speaks to some of the issues that Kimberly identified of um, overcoming you know, a high level um, practice-based quantification that does not reward farmers and ranchers who actually do more and see a better outcome um, on, their, on their farm or ranch. So we're really focused on creating a signal so that farmers and ranchers know the more you do to move the needle, the more credits you can actually generate. In terms of the high-level timeline, um, we started our market assessment phase in 2017, and this involved looking at not just markets, so carbon markets, water quality markets, water quantity markets in North America, but also protocols, quantification approaches, 
everything, uh, we looked at every part of market design um, before we started our own market design. We spent 2018 fully focusing on a design of our market, our infrastructure, what are the investments we need to make to make this scalable and cost effective for farmers and ranchers. And then we started in 2019 with a soft launch of our program. And I'll walk you through what we've been doing there. Um, but truly building it out and testing it with the entire agricultural supply chain and value chain um, and stakeholders at the table. Um, so I will I'll show you who our members are, but they include not just um, the agricultural supply chain and, and farmers and ranchers themselves, but the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Energy, um, and Environmental Protection Agency, so that we're all coordinating and moving in the same direction. We are preparing right now for a full market launch in 2022, but as I pointed out, we did a soft, mar a, a soft launch in 2019, and um, so we are generating and selling credits as part of what we're doing now in a pilot phase to ensure uh, that we're meeting member demands and demand side aspects, as well as um, ensuring farmers and ranchers that the system works. I have three slides that will show you our members and our investors and funders. Um, they are participating in our public-private partnership at various levels. The important point I want to show here is, again, we have the entire agricultural supply chain and value chain investing their money and participating with us in this build out. So everyone from grain integrators and, and integrators like ADM, Bungie and Cargill to um, uh, more consumer facing organizations like General Mills, McDonald's, Nestle, etc. But also um, uh, research institutions as well as um, global nonprofits like the Nature Conservancy and World Wildlife Fund. So this is our founding circle members who have a greater uh, value proposition in terms of their investments. These are our leg what we call legacy partner members. And as you see, it includes um, farm groups like the American Farm Bureau Federation, National Farmers Union, um, National Academies Beef Association, Soybean Growers, National Corn Growers, as well as um, universities and ag tech companies who are operating in this space. And, and that's really the, the whole goal of this is again, to ensure that as we're building this out, we're including all of the stakeholders who have a stake, if you will, in ensuring that we're building a credible, cost-effective, um, scientifically valid market. I want to talk just a little bit about market design. It gets to some of the issues that Kimberly was talking about. Um, one of the things in our assessment we found is that most markets currently, including carbon markets and water quality markets, were built around point source pollution approaches and not non-point sources, which agriculture is. And that has resulted in rules and approaches that are not flexible enough to allow uh, the flexibility required when you're working in agricultural, ecological, biological systems. Um, so we have really created our market design to ensure that we are flexible in accounting for the fact that farmers and ranchers live in uh, an environment in which they have to respond and change their responses daily, weekly, monthly, et cetera. We don't want to tie their hands. We want to actually make them better stewards by giving them flexibility. Um, biological systems are, are an important um, aspect, if you will, of the market design if you want to work with, want this to work for agriculture. I spoke about the market demand assessment that we commissioned. And what that assessment told us is there is multiple, there are multiple buyers, if you will, in this space. They're not the same. It's not one market that we're looking at. It's not a homogenous market. So we've created a market that can re uh, respond to variable market demand side needs um, and produce the outcomes or the credits or the impacts that are desired in those multiple markets. And I'll speak to that a little bit more. The other thing we've done is instead of looking at one outcome like just so carbon, 
we stack assets and values, it turns out that most of the practices that change the needle or move the needle on improving soil carbon and reducing net greenhouse gas emissions also impact water quality, also impact water use conservation. By, cap, by creating one system that quantifies all of those impacts and then selling those assets, either stacked together or variably to different buyers, we can improve the financial benefit and reward to farmers and ranchers based on the systems they are engaging in. So that is how we've designed our market. I spoke a little bit to this. We are um, an outcomes-based program. So we focused on systems, not practices. When a farmer or rancher engages, we look at what is the baseline for all of the ecological assets that we are interested in looking at. And then we track changes in that over time in a way that we can quantify it. We use um, a greenhouse gas quantification model, a biogeochemical process model known as DNDC, to quantify our greenhouse gases. But we also require soil carbon sampling at year 0, 5, 10, 15, and 20. And that is because we know that we don't have really good soil carbon data across the horizon, as Kimberly pointed out. And we do use a stratification tool for the soil carbon sampling to ensure that wherever you are operating as a farmer and rancher, we are doing um, a, a, a good job of taking those soil samples um, and ensuring that it gives a really good picture of your fields and your farms. We, uh, like Kimberly, are using a three-inch soil, um, three-inch getting soil carbon probe for the sampling, and we're sampling down to 30 centimeters. But we do allow uh, all of our members to soil sample down to 60 centimeters because we do know in some deep-rooted systems, you are actually going to see more variability below the 30 centimeter horizon. Um, and if, in fact, you do see that, see accumulation below the 30 centimeter horizon, you should be able to track it and be pleased. Another market design approach we have incorporated is we've redefined eligibility. Existing markets often require that if a farmer or rancher has engaged in a certain practice prior to the baseline, uh, they cannot participate. So we have eliminated that from our program um, anyone can join. What, our, what we're, our, our opportunity set is um, here is to engage farmers and ranchers wherever they are and provide them opportunities to improve their ecological outcomes in a way that we're quantifying it, we're tracking it, we can report it, and again, we can provide them financial incentives to do it. The last thing that I think is incredibly important is we're trying to create a market that over the course of the United States, and ultimately North America and beyond that, we have one harmonized approach. So the metrics are harmonized, the um, enrollment is harmonized, the outputs and how you get paid is harmonized across the entire um, country. So whether you are operating in Idaho or Georgia or Texas or California, the expectations, the process, the metrics is all the same. And that's important for both sellers or agricultural um, producers as well as the buyer so that they know what to expect and can participate. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I spoke to how we created our market and designed it to uh, be able to create or respond to demand in different markets. This is a simple scheme that speaks to that a little bit more. If you think just about the carbon aspects and carbon markets, Currently, there's demand from corporations for corporate social responsibility um, improvements uh, for carbon and other ecological assets, which we refer to as scope three. It's commensurate with how they're reporting. We can create outcomes within our system that meet those demands for corporations. We can also, because our logic and our protocols are, are built in a way that allows for this, increase the rigor of what we're quantifying, which increases the cost, and create um, carbon offsets for existing um, environmental mar carbon offset markets. So um, there's differences in both rigor, quantification inputs, 
and outputs for those two different tiers, if you will, of markets that we can um, speak to. There's also differences in uh, the amount of verification that has to happen. This is one important component of how we're operating now. I spoke to the public-private partnership. We did receive an award from the Foundation for Food and Ag Research um, in 2019, which provides $10.3 million in cash over three years that we are matching with cash and in-kind services of all of our members. And with that, we are investing in the research, the de development, the demonstration, the deployment activities to really scale this market across the country and ensure that we are technologically advanced, that we are uh, investing in new technologies to reduce the cost of soil sampling for farmers and ranchers while improving the rigor. Um, we're also with all of our members piloting in new regions and production systems as we build out our protocols. Um, and we're creating through this process a program so that we have a continuous feedback loop so we can continue to improve our program over time. So any proceeds we get from the program, which is really to cover our costs, we invest back into the program to ensure that it's improved over time. Finally, one of the things we're do work doing as part of this entire build out is working on certification of our program, our protocols, as well as the credits and assets with gold standard and sustained cert, which are global certifiers in this space. This is a nice little simple schematic to just show how the market works. So producer enrolls um, in our program. That is where soil carbon sampling is uh, required at um, enrollments, and that's year zero, and it will be required again at years five and 10 and 15, et cetera. Um, we, ESMC, because we've built the program to do this, we undertake the quantification of the soil carbon, the greenhouse gas, water quality, and water conservation credits. We then have a, a verification process that varies with the scope, as I indicated serialize the credits, sell them, and then pay the farmers and ranchers um, for the impacts on their farms and fields that we are able to quantify. And we do this on an annual basis. Now, soil carbon will not accrue that um, quickly. Um, so we can, we can look at that two ways. I pointed to the um, soil carbon sampling so that we can true up our estimations through modeling at year five and at year 10. Um, but one of our hopes is that through this system, we can not only provide feedback to farmers and ranchers about how well they're doing, depending on the practices or systems they themselves choose to engage in, um, but we can report out at a national scale the trends and the impacts we're seeing because we know we will see regional differences. We know we will see deep differences based on production systems. And we will be able to track that and report that out at a national level. This is where um, the colored regions on this uh, map show where we, our protocols actually apply right now. The way we are building our protocols is um, because we know quantification and impacts and outcomes are highly variable across regions, across time and across space. Um, we're building the protocols in a way that is science-based and, and standards-based. So the protocol boundary regions, um, a farmer and rancher will never see this, but what, how the protocols work behind the scenes are based on USDA land resource regions, as well as major crop zones. So that for each of these black boundaries you see on our protocols, um, the quantification approaches are a little bit different. But again, the, the farmer and rancher will never know this. But our protocols currently apply to the colored regions that you see on here. We are in, the, in, um, in fact building it out at a national level. Where we are pilot testing right now with our members um, the blue stars are regions and areas where we are, are currently pilot testing with our members in various systems, including grazing land, pasture land, grassland systems, as well as row crop systems. 
the blue and orange stars are um, pilots that we will be soon announcing that the, they're in the, the planning stages, some of them in the final planning stages, some of them in the early planning stages. The yellow stars point to um, pilot projects that we are right now just starting discussions on and building out our protocols so that we can in fact actually move the pilots there. By the time we launch our program in 2022, we will not be operating necessarily at a national scale, but we will be operating in all of these regions at scale, as well as some additional ones. Um, that is the end of my, the, the formal presentation, but I hope I did answer the, the question that you're most interested in, I think is, how do we achieve scale in agricultural practices and support soil health changes across the country? Thank you. Thank you very much, Debbie, for this presentation. It's uh, it's interesting to see the, the the willingness of the farmers to enter a system, but how complex the system is according to the place, according to the players, and and well, we really need to design this kind of protocol and this kind of um, uh, action to to be able to put together. The, the supplier, the, the farmers, and also the, the, the customer. The customer need to understand also all the efforts behind all of those. So thank you very much. I think we, we find a way to be connected with Dan. So um, now- Are you able to hear me, My Paul? pleasure is to give the floor to, to Dan Harbrook. He is the head of carbon quantification at Indigo Ag and he will present the uh, Indigo Hag Carbon Business and Experimental Initiative. Dan, I hope you can hear me and uh, you have the floor. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks to the team for helping to work through some technical difficulties here. So um, my name is Dan Harburg. I'm a vice president and the head of carbon quantification here at Indigo. And what I wanted to do was give a little bit of an overview of Indigo's business, and then uh, three of the different components of our carbon initiatives that we're working on, both the market side, as well as some of the technology explorations and our research and experimental efforts. Um, because we, as a company, believe that, uh, and I, this echoes a lot of <clears throat> what the other panelists have said, you know, we believe that both uh, the science needs to continue to advance here. Um, the technology needs to continue to advance and we need to put the right incentives in place for, for farmers to be paid for greenhouse gas outcomes. So on the next slide, um, a very quick overview. Indigo is a company that is dedicated to harnessing nature to help farmers sustainably feed the planet. And we think about that from three different perspectives of improving farm profitability, improving the sustainability of the agricultural system and of better aligning <clears throat> agricultural practices with consumer health. On the next slide, one of our fundamental beliefs as a company is that as long as the agricultural system continues to pay farmers to produce commodities, farmers will lack the incentives to adopt new technologies that improve food quality and sustainability. However, if we can find ways to decommoditize the agricultural system and actually pay farmers for some of the outcomes um, for the particular crops that they're producing, we believe that the industry can actually change quite rapidly. And it's for that reason that on the next slide, as you see the way that Indigo is, is structuring itself, we have essentially three different marketplaces, all of which work in tandem to try to help growers earn additional revenue for decommoditized agricultural products. So Indigo works in <clears throat> the primary commodity crops. We work in corn, cotton, soy, rice, wheat, and other crops like that across the US, as well as in South America and in Europe. But uh, we think it's, it's very important, for example, as you think about, say, um, a, a variety of wheat that has a lower carbon footprint or has used less pesticides or fertilizers, it's important to actually be able to set up an entire ecosystem for selling, transacting, and moving those grains in unique ways. And so for us, the carbon, carbon marketplace, which we're setting up now, essentially teams up with these other marketplaces to be able to pay growers for sustainable outcomes in the form of carbon credits, 
and then to allow growers to physically transact that grain with an associated carbon credit tied to it. So if you move to the next slide. So Indigo is developing a host of different technologies that will help us build these three decommoditizing marketplaces. So those include solutions like microbiome products, our digital agronomy offerings, financing solutions, insurance solutions, quality testing, farm storage, and other consumer product offerings, all of which we believe will help to allow growers to make transitions in their practices that, that result in higher levels of sustainability. So as we've looked around at the carbon markets and opportunities in agriculture for sequestration and emissions reduction, uh, much of this again is, is echoes what, uh, what Kimberly and Debbie have already talked about here today. But some of the challenges that we have seen are that there are very high costs of measurement and verification of greenhouse gases and soil carbon today. Second, there is not a great set of technologies that allow growers to shift away from the practices that they're using today that are detrimental to the environment. And then finally, there are no real incentive structures in place that allow growers to be supported through those behavioral changes, which are, are quite significant. And so as Indigo approaches this opportunity, uh, some of our unique uh, opportunities here are to think about how we can use new technologies, data collection and algorithms to drive scale and reduce costs. Um, one of those areas is in soil sampling, where we believe that there's an opportunity to significantly reduce the, the labor and analytical costs by deploying new technologies over the coming years. Second, we believe that we can leverage data science and microbial technologies to reduce the amount of chemicals and fertilizers that are needed in the field. Uh, this has a, a, a huge impact, right? The better, the better recommendations we can provide a grower with that actually allow them to reduce um, their, their use of these harmful chemicals, they are not only able to earn credits, uh, which, which will pay them for the carbon benefit of what they're doing, they are also spending less money on those inputs. And so there's a, a real win-win opportunity for the grower who is now seeing a you know, higher level of profitability while also having a, a better environmental outcome. Finally, we believe that uh, accelerating the adoption of agricultural practices that reduce greenhouse gas emissions is, you know, requires the right kind of incentive structures in place. And this will both come through paying farmers directly for uh, premiums on uh, on the crops that they're producing that have lower footprints, as well as creating a carbon marketplace uh, that pays growers directly for the, the carbon benefit. So on the next slide, so Indigo Carbon is creating an end-to-end -end system that will allow growers to be paid for abatement and sequestration. And you can click through, uh, just continue to click through to, to show each of the icons on here. Uh, so growers enroll in Indigo Carbon's program. We establish a baseline at the beginning of the program. We support farmers in the transition to regenerative practices. And this is a component that I think is, is really important. These practices are often not straightforward to implement. The same practice does not work in every part of, of even the same uh, land resource region or of the same county. And so figuring out what the specific farmer needs and giving them the agricultural advice uh, in, in a clear way is, is really critical. So we provide that support directly to growers. We help with gathering data, both manually and automatically from equipment on the growers operations, uh, from logs that they have, and as well as remote data sources. We process that data um, to determine the greenhouse gas abatement and soil carbon sequestration associated. We generate a, a credit uh, that is verified and validated. And then if you click two more forward, we sell those offsets to, to buyers and transfer the value back to the grower. And then the next slide. So I've touched on some of these pieces, but for us, there are really four cornerstones of allowing a marketplace to exist. So, you know, of course we need buyers and we need growers. We need folks who are willing to and interested in offsetting their emissions um, or insetting their emissions and, and buying a, a carbon credit, um, they will, you know, hopefully be sort of large volume supply or large volume buyers who, who come into these marketplaces. 
Similar, we need growers to participate. We need them to make practice changes. Um, we need them to, uh, to value and trust the quantification methods and the overall uh, rigor of the marketplace. And then in the middle, we need a very rigorous carbon quantification system that is both scientifically accurate and credible and has a low cost that continues to decline over time as new technologies are implemented. And then the second sort of middle piece that is critical here is what we call regenerative products, which are the systems that we use to prescribe practices to growers that allow them to maximize their overall profit. And carbon is a component of that profit, but it is not the only piece of that profit. So we think about Indigo's mission as standing beyond, uh, sort of beyond just the carbon market and thinking overall about the profitability at the grower level and what practices will ultimately be deployed to help them optimize that profitability. So Indigo is developing a number of uh, grower facing and agronomist facing technologies that will allow us to lower the burden of data collection for farmers participating in these programs. You could think of this like a turbo tax for those who are from the US of, of agriculture, uh, helping farmers move through the various steps of data collection, enrolling their fields and programs, recording events such as tillage and fertilizer, flagging specific pests or weeds in their fields, receiving uh, remote imagery of those fields, being able to connect data collection directly to equipment that they have, to other farm records uh, that they're producing, and essentially streamline the process of enrollment all the way through credit generation. So for us, this is a really critical leg of the stool. Um, not only do our growers interact with this platform, but our soil sampling staff interact with this platform. Our agronomists who are making practice recommendations interact with this type of a platform. And so all of those folks are both inputting and receiving data from the same centralized systems, and they can uh, leverage this, uh, these types of offerings to, to really bring scale to the project. So in the next slide, the, there are, as we've already heard, there are a number of different methodologies uh, that have been tried in this space in the past and some that are already deployed uh, and out there today. Generally speaking, those either suffer from being incredibly sample heavy, meaning that they are driven entirely based on soil sampling, or they're driven entirely based on modeling or default values or uh, lookup tables of, of some kind. Each of those efforts you know, suffers in, in, in ways of, of cost and accuracy. And we think that the methodologies that are in development now uh, will draw a balance between accuracy and cost, and over time continue to decrease in cost and increase in accuracy. This will be a really critical uh, building block for ensuring that these are both accessible to farmers, provide the most revenue opportunity to farmers, uh, and the best opportunity from a scientific rigor perspective to buyers. So in the next slide, Indigo is partnering with the Climate Action Reserve and with Vera to develop methodologies both in the US and internationally to, um, to, to facilitate this market. So we actually just a few weeks ago had our uh, the Climate Action Reserve's working group, which was a group of, of scientists from industry and academia and, and corporations um, from across the country and, and some international participants as well. Um, that working group uh, pushed the Climate Action Reserve's methodology through to public comment. So that's actually open to public comment right now. Uh, Vera is uh, moving through their uh, process at the moment as well and likely to go to public comment over the coming weeks. And we feel very confident that both of those uh, methodologies, you know, again, will allow Indigo and other project developers to leverage these approaches, both here in the U.S. and internationally. There are a few components of projects. Uh, if you go back to that slide for one more second, there are a few components of these projects that we think will particularly allow them to to be scalable, accurate, and flexible. That includes being able to have grouped portfolio projects. Um, where millions of acres across a given geography will be able to be grouped and then statistically sampled such that every single field in the program 
doesn't require its own <clears throat> its own unique quantification per se. Um, that approach, together with combining sampling and modeling and remote monitoring, uh, we believe will allow this program to to reach a, a cost effective scale quite quickly. Similarly, uh, the importance of of iteration in the science is really critical here, and that's what I'll spend the last few minutes of the presentation talking about. But the both of these methodologies are being set up such that as models continue to advance and as technologies continue to advance, those can be deployed um, to continue to bring costs down and increase accuracy. So I'll spend the last few minutes talking about two other programs at Indigo that are helping us push forward on the scientific and technology fronts um, related to carbon. So the first is what we call the Terraton Challenge. The Terraton Challenge was launched about a year ago um, where Indigo sought to support entrepreneurs who are developing technologies for accelerating, quantifying, and rewarding growers for carbon sequestration and greenhouse gas emissions reduction. In the next slide, you can see a list of the current 30 participants that we are working with. So we had about 260 applicants from over 40 countries around the world submitting their technologies for consideration in this, uh, in this challenge. And we selected a, a top set of those which are shown here, whom we are now working with to evaluate these technologies. Uh, some of these are tools that will reduce the cost uh, or burden of soil sampling in the field. So others are looking at um, new technologies that are lab-based that could bring down the costs of, of soil carbon quantification. Um, others are uh, remote sensing approaches. And some of these are other marketplaces that while they might be competitive in some ways with our own efforts, we, we see uh, the development of an overall ecosystem of marketplaces as being an incredibly powerful tool uh, to push forward uh, the, the global efforts in, in soil carbon. So on the next slide, Indigo is providing these Terraton Challenge innovators with a number of key resources. We're helping evaluate their technologies. We're helping to uh, provide them market access and visibility, and we're providing partnership and collaboration both with us and, and with other entities. And then the final slide, um, another really critical component of this is, uh, you know, as you've heard from, from others again, is continuing to develop the science and thinking about how things like deep soil carbon are connected to management practices, uh, driving forward the um, the recommendations that we provide to growers, so thinking about what are the best practices for a given soil type and a given region to drive soil carbon sequestration, um, you know, considering things like permanence and trying to understand how, uh, how permanent various uh, forms of soil carbon are and what practices link to those different forms of soil carbon. So there are a number of different research goals that we have as an organization. And we started last year sampling farms uh, around the, the country. Um, we pulled about 3,300 soil samples to this point that are down to a meter depth um, from, from that cohort. We're looking at a number of different measurements, including soil carbon and bulk density, uh, as well as, as interviewing these growers that are participating in this program and collecting soil microbial community sequencing so that we can understand some of the connections between the microbiology uh, and, and the practices that they're implementing. And we're working with a number of university and institutional research partners to analyze and publish the results uh, that we collect from these farms. This will be a, a multi-year, possibly multi-decadal research effort for us because uh, of course we are looking at tracking the changes from field to field over time as growers are, some growers in this program are transitioning into more um, soil health practices, others are already using those practices. So we have a number of different research cohorts in this, uh, in this experiment. And we're excited to see how this can better inform our market as well as others' markets in the future. So that's the end of, of my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dan, for, for this presentation. That's, um, well, those three presentations show clearly that the, the things are not so easy and uh, the, everything is interconnected and people try to, to work at different level. That's interesting to have the, 
I would say the different level of uh, the work presented by Kimberly, the one presented by Debbie, and, and finally by Dan. So it, it's, um, that brings us to the end of the presentation for this session. So now I think we will open the 30 minute time for question and answer. Um, during that time, I would like uh, my colleagues to open the, the, the specific windows for the multiple choice questions for the participant. So to the participant, we have, uh, you have the entire time of this Q&A um, part, sorry, of the session to answer them by choosing one, one or more answer to each question. Three maximum, please, when you have the possibility to choose more than one. You must answer all the questions before you can submit your full answer to the system. So the result of this questionnaire will be communicated to you later. Uh, we, we already have this uh, running for three days and uh, it's interesting because we have some common question and some other are particular specific to this session and sometimes to the same question, the, the answers are different according to the, the people who participate. So please uh, use this time to uh, fill those questionnaires. That will be very useful for us. So we have um, some question for all of the three speakers. First, I will start with uh, Kimberly. Um, Kimberly, we have a question about the fact that um, people are doubtful about the fact that four core per square kilometer will be dense enough to track changes in the, in the time. Well, can you answer to that? Because we're using, because the sampling design isn't coming randomly, it's coming through the 60 layers of covariate input data, the four, it, it will, it, because this, the soil samples don't stand on their own, I guess. They take all those other factors into consideration, and so the soil samples validate what the mapping and the remotely sensed data is already saying. So that's how we're able to have a sampling density that low to track changes in, in, in soil carbon and other soil variables. Okay, thank you. Um, Debbie, there is a question uh, concerning um, ESMC uh, and if it could work with the forestry sector and the agroforestry sector as well. That's a good question. So our protocols and methodologies do allow for um, agroforestry, but not forestry systems because we feel the Markets and the protocols for forestry systems are actually pretty robust internationally and also in North America. Um, so we are not seeking to include forestry, but agroforestry, absolutely. Okay, um, done. Uh, there's a question for you about the CAR protocol who allow for only one production practice to be changed and the entire system to be run by a project aggregator. How does this meet your farmer's principle presented? Um, so if I, if I understand what you're saying, uh, it, the question is that it allows for only one practice being changed, is that? Yes, one practice change, yes. Um, well, the, the protocol actually, it, only requires that a grower make a single practice change to demonstrate additionality, but we will, or the, the protocol itself will uh, reward growers for any changes relative to their baseline that they're making. So the hope is growers are making um, many practice changes simultaneously and seeing an impact on greenhouse gas emissions and um, soil carbon sequestration from, from that stack. So it, we've, tried, we've tried to set the bar as low as possible to allow as many growers to participate um, with, with, that, uh, with that requirement. So I think the question may be a bit uh, misguided, but hopefully that clears it up. Yes, thank you very much. I think it was a little bit, yes. <laughs> um, there's a question for all of you. Uh, and it, it, it is linked to the the land owner, most of the farmers or many farmers lease the land of their farm. And in, in the system you all presented, 
will the, the landowner or the farmer be paid for the carbon sequestered? It is very important because we are talking in, in years, we are not talking in, in months. And uh, so maybe the lease will end and uh, what will happen at the end of the lease uh, with the money the farmer receive or the, the landowner? Um, Kimberly, you start. Um, traditionally in the Alberta system, it's been paid to the landholder, but it is it, it can be negotiated within, uh, it's, it's really the contract with the aggregator that would, that the landowner and the, the lease owner could potentially um, either split it or they, they could develop their own con contract system. We, we don't like um, both Debbie and Dan or Indigo and are, are much further down that line of, of, of what that could look like. And, and we're still just very much in the carbon, carbon measurement and monitoring space. So, but that's how it's been okay. done in Alberta to date. Okay, thank you for for having answered part of the question, even though it's not really exactly what what you are doing and what you, you are competent in. Uh, Debbie, you, you have maybe more information about that for us. Yes, because we're selling assets, whether they're credits or um, outcomes for companies, we require ownership be established up front. So we do have contracts that farmers can use, leaseholders in particular that they use to negotiate with the landowner who owns the assets. And we don't have, we're, we're totally agnostic how that works out, but ownership does need to be established before an asset can be valued and traded. So um, whether it's 100% ownership by the um, farmer or rancher or the landowner or it's shared value, we let them come to that negotiation, we just require it be established up front and a contractual agreement. Okay, this is a sensitive point, I think. Yes. Uh, Dan, can you answer that part? Yes, yeah, so this is definitely an area that we've thought quite a bit about and our, our contracts are set up explicitly with the operators directly. So directly with the farmers. Um, we, we have the opportunity for a farmer who transitions off of land and a new operator coming in to essentially continue on the, the practices that were previously implemented there and essentially transfer uh, the, the, the payments to the next land operator. But given the, the complications of ownership and leases and so on, we didn't want to add another hurdle to the process for enrollment. Mm -hmm. And the, the grower themselves is the one who is implementing the practice changes. And so um, the Climate Action Reserve has put forward a, a protocol that allows for direct participation um, with the uh, with the landowner. Okay, thank you. Um, this is very interesting because uh, in some part of the world, the agriculture is mainly working on the relation with the landholder and and the farmers. And I'm thinking about the uh, what's happening in Ukraine, and you have huge farm but they are owned by all states or uh, land owner that are not the one we are working on the land and so the interests are different and uh, if you are paying the land owner for the work done by the farmer the farmer at once will say well it's not not worth for me to develop such practice because i have no return from my, my work so another well it's quite similar and i would like all of you to to answer that question um how would small rancher work uh, with your system to get paid for ecosystem benefits? Or, or your system is mainly working with large scale producer or what is, the, what is the room for the small farmers and the small rancher? Who want to answer first? I can start. I can... Oh, oh, go oh, ahead, Kimberly. Um, <laughs> no, maybe you go first. Go, go, go okay. Oh. Yeah, so um, we are scale agnostic, really. So we're building this so that we can work with any size farmer or rancher. Um, ultimately, right, what we want is impact. We want to scale across the horizon, but we know that means we need to work with every um, farmer and rancher where they are, right? And um, it, we, I, I personally think this is not a goal of our prog program, but if in fact we are going to um, enable particularly small farmers and ranchers to continue in this landscape, 
we have to be sensitive to their needs. And I think particularly now, the structural and other impacts that we're seeing with things like COVID-19 um, requires that we continue to be sensitive to it and um, responsive to that. So we are specifically trying to be um, for various reasons. And I'll really? echo I'll echo that as well. We're we're working with both smaller scale and, and larger scale farmers. And and what we are seeing is in some cases that the smaller scale farms are much more intensively managed and they are seeing a higher higher rate of carbon accrual than we're seeing on larger scale ranches that are not being as intensively managed because there just isn't enough there there's enough manpower or there isn't enough actual cattle even to to really drive that carbon drive those practice changes and drive those that the 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 soil structure to be different so it's i think there's there's um mechanisms in both and i think that um it, it the scale i think we're all working at um using mapping and, and 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 larger scale technology that can capture both small and large scale farmers and one yeah one point from my side on this um small scale farmers are certainly participating in, in the program for us and it's one of the areas where we think technology as well as aggregation is going to be really helpful to allowing those um, those smaller producers to participate you know, if, if a small producer had to pay the costs of all of the quantification and verification on just their land, uh, the, you know, it might not be cost effective for them to do so. However, if they're a part of a group project uh, that helps to reduce, um, you know, reduce those project costs and, you know, combine them together with other growers who are experiencing similar outcomes to them, then we believe that this can be cost effective at very small scales. So, you know, you could still have a project that aggregates millions of acres, but have that being built of many farmers who are operating on, you know, hundreds or even less, less than hundreds of acres. Thank you, Dan. Um, there is a question for Debbie. Is there a specific reason why there isn't a presence of ESE, ESMC in the thousand U.S.? Um, so, uh, we have been building out our protocol region by region um, based on member demand. So largely the demand of the buyers right now. We will get to the Southeast, but first we will be going to the Pacific Northwest where there's a greater demand and then we'll be going to the Southeast, but we are definitely um, going to the Southeast. Okay. Well, there is a comment. Um for all of you, I guess it's coming from uh, from farmers or I mean, at least somebody from the civil society. They said that they are desperate for pricing signal. The, the various soil carbon effort seems to be incredibly fragmented with each offering their own carbon token. Um, is, there, um, is there any planning to, to unify this emerging unit for current market? It's true that we, we are experiencing uh, very, I mean, a lot of initiative, and um, it seems that each initiative ignore what the other one is doing. Is there a way to try to make those initiatives converge in the same direction, and in order to help also the farmers and uh, to to find the the best uh, the the best way to to be uh, paid for for the, the carbon sequestration. I know that all, all your initiatives are quite, I mean, young, but uh, maybe you have an idea for the coming years. Yeah, so, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I just, I'll, I'll, I'll just now. go quickly and then, because I, um, we're, we're really looking at working with the existing structures that exist um, policy-wise in, with the Alberta framework and, and the Canadian national government is also looking at a soil carbon or as is, is looking at an offset building a national offset system and so we feel that given that Canada has put a price on carbon um, it's it's the most uh, it, it'll return the biggest bang for the buck to the producers um, in the long run so that's what we're focused on on working with 
Debbie? Thank you. So we've been assessing the um, market structure and uh, price variability. And right now, carbon credits sell for about three, anywhere from three to twenty dollars per ton CO2 uh, equivalent. We know that soil carbon in particular and other um, ecosystem services from agriculture are undervalued. And we hope that in an outcomes-based and income impact-based approach, we can do two things. Continue to um, better valuate. In other words, look at the true value of those impacts and move the market in those directions so that we're actually paying for the true value of these services. I think it will take time. The way the current markets work, we have seen that uh, soil carbon and other credits from agriculture are increasing in demand because of the multiple ecological assets associated with just the carbon attribute. We think that will continue into the future and will help but we think we also have to do a better job showing the true economic impact of the outcomes um, as we put them out into these marketplaces. Thank you, Dan, do you want to add something on that? Yeah, I think it's an important area where working with the, uh, the registries is a, a critical component here. So registries, the, the nationally, internationally recognized registries are you know, already have a number of different methodologies that they're developing, and there will continue to be refinements in those methodologies um, as we go, and as as again as technologies continue to enhance. So, I, you know, I think that there will <clears throat> there will clearly be some that that will evolve, some that won't make sense in some time, and and we will continue to converge in that way on on the best approaches. And I think all of these, because of the public an open approach that they're taking, you know, we're kind of learning the best we can from each other um, and looking for opportunities to partner wherever possible. So, you know, I, I definitely see convergence as we continue to move forward. Well, there's a, a question also for all of you and it, it comes through all the session. <laughs> we have a, we have biochar addict uh, listening to us. Uh, just um, how how you take in consideration the fact that the farmers can use biochar because it may change a little bit the measurement and the, the quantity of carbon you you may store in the soil. Who want to answer to that? I can start. I myself am yes. a biochar addict, <laughs> okay. and um, I so I think there's two ways to do this, right? I think we have to continue to better characterize biochar its chemical and its physical attributes, as well as the longevity of the stored carbon in biochar. I think that's incredibly essential for it to be included in carbon markets, right? We're not going to be measuring the longevity of biochar once it's put in the soil. You have to do it before it goes into the soil. Um, and I think once we have a better approach to do that and can assure um, transparently and credibly, the longevity of the biochar product, um, we can better evaluate it and include it in um, carbon markets and other markets. Um, it, it, it's important that for credibility and transparency, um, we all agree, if you will, on what those criteria are for characterizing it and ensuring the longevity. I think it's a huge tool in our toolkit, if you will, for improving soil carbon and reducing carbon um, drawdown approaches. Yeah, I completely agree with what Debbie said. I mean, I, I think that biochar to me sits within a class of, of emerging, other emerging technologies as well that, you know, whether that's uh, enhancing the root, root structure of plants so that they decompose less quickly or increasing nitrogen use efficiency through um, microbes or other sources, right? There will, there will be all kinds of, of new things that we need to develop first quantification approaches for, uh, and then can, can look to include those uh, in, our, in our markets. We have to look at, at the holistic carbon picture though, sort of pre-production you know, and, and into use on the farm, a grower who you know, is, is putting a lot of manure, for example, from a, a you know, onto their fields, 
we we you know just the, the same as, as Debbie was just mentioning about you know biochar. We also need to consider you know where that manure is coming from, its carbon footprint, and thinking about all these things holistically. Mm. So I'm I'm confident that we will develop good quantification approaches for for each of these for each of these technologies, but um, but we just we have to be holistic in the way we think about them. Kimbala, you want to add something on biochar? Um, I, I, I think I agree definitely with Debbie about that we need to quantify that before it goes into the soil. And I, I guess I also just want to, and this isn't a separate, but I think we need to be looking at photosynthetically derived carbon as a, and the, and as, as I think they need to be done in partnership. And I think we need to look at, as Dan said, the holistic picture of how it all fits together, but to be tracking all elements and all contributors of carbon to the soil. Okay, but anyway, this is a new technique and this is interesting to evaluate it quite fast because if not, I mean, the people will, will not use it while the potential seems to be very high and, and it has to be uh, well understood a little bit better. It's, it's very interesting because when you discuss with the, the farmers or the scientists, the, the, the purpose are not the same. The farmers are very enthusiastic most of the time and the scientists are more reluctant to say, well, this is a good solution. Um, so we need to, to have answers to those questions. Well, what we are experiencing at the moment with the COVID-19, I mean, show that science has no answer to all the questions we have. So we, we need to be <laughs> uh, patient, but uh, also this is not because we do not have the question, the, the answer to our question that we need not to go forward. That's that's also a kind of message that I would like to, to, to push. So uh, I think we, we've been through most of the question that people uh, ask. Um, uh, I would like to thank you very much. I just, I think this is the, the, the last word of our last session. If you allow me, I will switch to French to finish that session. So if you want to choose the, the language in your computer, you, you will have one minute to do so. I would like also to encourage the, the participants to answer the questionnaire because we have only 19 answers today. Uh, we will, I would like to get uh, to go over 20, that would be good. So please, a little bit uh, a small effort while I'm concluding, and uh, we will have uh, this uh, uh, this result. And I'm sure when we will publish the result of all those questions, yeah, you will be interested because according to the population, the, the answers are not the same as I said before. Bien, nous voilà donc arrivés au terme de notre dernière session. Uh, il nous reste uh, ce qui est sera un gros travail à présent à synthétiser tout ce qui a été dit, échangé, tout ce qui a été présenté. Les vidéos et les supports des présentations et la synthèse seront mis à votre disposition de tous, participants et orateurs, dans les meilleurs délais. Ça va dépendre de notre capacité à faire cette synthèse. Et nous vous enverrons un mail personnellement à tous pour avoir les résultats, de façon à ce que vous soyez tous informés. Au moment de conclure euh, cette euh, semaine euh, assez dense, je dois le dire, euh, je voudrais adresser un, un grand, grand merci à tous nos orateurs. Ils ont été 21 à se succéder euh, durant nos cinq sessions. Merci, merci beaucoup à tous. Sans vous, euh, eh bien, ces réunions n'avaient pas lieu d'être et nous n'aurions pas pu échanger sur des bases, euh, des points de vue qui étaient tellement différents, mais aussi qui montrent l'importance d'aller de l'avant sur ces questions du carbone dans les sols. Un grand merci à nos traducteurs, euh, Peter et Pierre, qui nous ont suivis dans cette aventure, dans des conditions techniques euh, parfois, parfois limites. Et puis, merci à vous tous euh, pour votre participation, vos questions, pour avoir répondu aux questionnaires en ligne. Nous sommes à 23 pour aujourd'hui, donc c'est bien, on a dépassé les 20, c'est super. Euh, des sessions 2 à 5. Le premier jour, vous étiez 92 en ligne. Mardi, on était 80. Je compte pas les orateurs. Mercredi, 88. Jeudi, à nouveau 80. Aujourd'hui, nous étions 68. Euh, ça s'est un petit peu émoussé. Nous sommes vendredi soir pour ceux qui sont en Europe. Vendredi 
en milieu de journée pour vous qui êtes en Amérique du Nord, ou même encore plus tôt. Mais au total, ce sont plus de 200 personnes qui se sont inscrites pour assister à notre événement. Et, et vraiment, un grand, grand merci à tous. Grâce à l'ensemble de ces contributions, vous avez collégialement fait de cette réunion régionale Amérique du Nord une première, un succès au-delà de nos espérances. Les circonstances particulières qui nous ont conduites à organiser cette réunion de façon dématérialisée ont malgré tout permis d'accroître l'audience de cet événement régional et d'élargir le réseau de l'initiative 4 pour 1000, et nous en sommes très heureux. C'est une des raisons d'être de notre initiative. Et si vous appartenez à une organisation, une institution, une administration, une entreprise, un, gouverne, un groupement de producteurs intéressés à nous rejoindre, n'hésitez pas à le faire. Je fais un petit peu ma pub dans cette fin de ces sessions, mais c'est important. Plus on sera nombreux, plus on sera fort. Vous trouverez les informations nécessaires sur notre site internet www.4p1000.org ou vous pouvez nous contacter à secrétariat at 4 pmilorg Avant de vous dire au revoir, car il est probable que nous organisions d'autres réunions régionales Amérique du Nord dans les années qui viennent, je voudrais saluer le professionnalisme de l'équipe de Régénération Canada, qui, avec notre équipe de l'initiative 4 pour 1000, a collaboré activement à l'organisation de cet événement. C'est grâce à vous, Antonius, Sarah, sans oublier bien sûr Gabriel, que nous avons pu le faire dans d'excellentes conditions. Béatrice et moi, nous vous adressons publiquement un immense merci. Avant de dire euh, bonne journée à tous, euh, Gabi, Antonius, Sarah, est-ce que vous avez quelque chose à rajouter avant qu'on se quitte euh... <rire> Tout le temps émotionnel, la dernière session. Euh, je voulais euh, répondre à ça. Je voulais te remercier à toi, euh, Paul, à, à Béatrice et toute l'équipe des 4 pour 1000 d'être si patient, si collaborative. C'était vraiment un honneur puis, puis, puis un privilège de travailler avec vous pour, pour co-organiser la, la réunion. Euh, de la part de Régénération Canada, j'aimerais aussi remercier tous les, les panélistes, les, les conférenciers, conférencières euh, d'aujourd'hui, Kimberly, Debbie et Dan, puis toutes les, euh, toutes les autres durant les dernières euh, cinq jours. C'était tellement riche et inspirant. Vous jouez vraiment un rôle crucial euh, 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 dans le, la, la santé du sol, puis la séquestration de carbone euh, en Amérique du Nord et, euh, et, euh, et partout dans le monde. Donc, je voulais juste te dire un gros merci. Puis, euh, je ne sais pas si Gab ou Sarah vous voulez dire un mot. Ben, tu l'as très bien dit, Antonius. Je, je vais juste prendre la parole un petit moment pour euh, oui, remercier là, le, le 4 pour 1000 pour euh, tout votre leadership, là, pour euh, propulser et puis, puis stimuler ces conversations-là à un niveau international, puis de, de mettre en contact des membres qui sont impliqués dans ce mouvement-là, euh, ça, à travers le monde. Là, je, veux, je veux faire écho à ce que Debbie et Kimberly ont mentionné tout à l'heure. Je pense que c'est ça, on est tellement tous reconnaissants euh, depuis le moment là, où vous avez commencé en, en 2015 là, de, de voir euh, ça, là, tout, tout le beau travail que vous faites. Puis je pense qu'on en bénéficie tous. Alors, euh, un gros merci. Puis c'était vraiment un, un plaisir de travailler avec vous deux, Paul et Béatrice, euh, sur cette rencontre. Euh, un gros merci à tous les, les panélistes et conférenciers pour votre travail et d'avoir pris le temps de partager tout ça avec nous et avec les participants. Merci aux participants de, de vous être joints à nous et, euh, et je, veux, je veux finir par un, un gros merci euh, ben, à tout le monde de, de mon équipe pour avoir participé, mais un merci spécial à Antonius qui a vraiment, euh, vraiment euh, donné du travail euh, dévoué là, pour euh, coordonner euh, cette rencontre-là. Alors, euh, merci euh, spécial à toi, Antonius, et à tout le monde euh, d'avoir pris le temps là, pour euh, cette belle rencontre. Merci. Le grand moment est de nous dire au revoir à tous définitivement, au moins pour cette session. Euh, moi, personnellement, je dois dire que j'ai beaucoup appris euh, de ce qui se passe aux États-Unis et au Canada. Je suis, depuis bientôt plus de quatre ans, je, je travaille euh, au sein du, de l'initiative 4 pour 1000. J'ai rencontré beaucoup de gens, j'ai beaucoup voyagé, j'ai eu cette chance. Et, et je crois que l'image qu'on a de ce qui se passe en Amérique du Nord depuis l'Europe est assez déformée par euh, tout ce que les médias veulent bien nous dire. Mais je dois dire que je dois saluer tous les efforts et toutes les initiatives qui ont été lancées, dont beaucoup se trouvent être originaires de, 
de, de cette partie du monde. Euh, il y a encore beaucoup à faire. C'est vrai qu'il y a des excès, comme partout, euh, au niveau de ce qui est produit en agriculture, la façon dont les choses sont produites. Et vous n'êtes pas exempt de, de certains reproches dans cette zone. Mais sincèrement, euh, tout ce qui se passe à tous les niveaux de la société euh, mérite d'être salué, même si de temps en temps, quelques leaders manquent un petit peu de clairvoyance et, et de, de leadership dans certains domaines, c'est le cas de le dire. Euh, on, on doit saluer ces efforts et je pense que nous avons beaucoup à apprendre, euh, encore une fois, du nouveau monde, de nous qui sommes de l'ancien monde. Mais euh, là, j'ai remis ma casquette de, de, de petit français. Euh, je voudrais donc euh, finir sur ce geste, sur ce signe d'espoir. C'est c'est vrai qu'il y a plein de choses qui sont en cours et j'espère que tout ce que nous avons entendu euh, aboutiront dans les années qui viennent. Je crois qu'il en va du salut de notre petite planète. Voilà, bonne journée à tous. Encore une fois, un grand merci pour votre participation. Faites attention à vous, faites attention pour vos proches et surtout à la santé de nos sols. Au revoir et à très bientôt. Merci. Au revoir. Merci.